Welcome to the last lecture for Chapter 3. Um, in this lecture, we'll be talking about the loanable funds market. So that's our last part to our model, simple model of the macroeconomy, is figuring out, well, where does the funding for investment come from? And it's essentially going to come from this loanable funds market. Now, we're going to present a very, very simple loanable funds framework. If you want a more complicated one, then that would be a course like Money and Banking that we would cover such a thing. We're going to present a very simple model of the financial system. In this model, we have one asset. Right? That asset's going to be something we call loanable funds. You can think these are, these are monies that are available to be lent. The demand for those funds is going to come from investment. Right? So businesses want to invest. To invest, they're going to borrow that money to do that investment. The supply of these funds comes from our savings. And, of course, the price is going to be what we call the real interest rate. So demand for loanable funds comes from investment. Firms borrow to finance spending on plants and equipment, new office buildings, etc. Um, consumers borrow to buy new houses. Now notice, remember we talked about consumption. And that consumption was not dependent on the interest rate. We don't have consumers borrowing. So why do we have consumers borrowing here? Well, that's because this is for new houses. Remember, um, there's a funny thing about how we deal with housing and GDP. GDP is what we call a flow variable. It's a rate of change. And housing, if I just go out and buy a house, say I buy one house that's worth $150,000, that's a stock value. And we can't just add stocks into flows. So to deal with that, we call housing residential investment. We talked about this briefly when we talked about investment. And so we think of buying a new house as investment. And so if you're going to live in your own house, so it's an owner-occupied home, we assume that the owner is a landlord renting the house to himself or herself. So that's why that's included in this investment aspect. And it's going to depend negatively on the real interest rate. The real interest rate is really has the interpretation of being the cost of borrowing. And so if the cost goes up, what do I want to do? I want to borrow less. If the cost goes down, I'm going to borrow more. So it's negatively dependent upon the real interest rate. So we can draw this out. And roughly, if we do, we put the real interest rate on the vertical axis and investments on the horizontal axis, we have the investment function. Well, this essentially is, within this very simplified model, our demand for loanable funds. Okay. Now let's think about the supply of loanable funds. The supply of loanable funds is savings. So if we don't spend it, we save it, and if we save it, what happens to it? You can think of it, it goes into the bank, or in this case, it goes into the financial system, because we haven't really developed something as sophisticated as a bank in this model. Uh, it goes into the financial system, and the financial system then lends it to other people. So where is the source of these loanable funds? The source of these loanable funds is savings. So households, they use their savings to make bank deposits purchase bonds and other assets, these funds become available to firms to borrow to finance investment spending. Um, government may also contribute to savings if it does not spend all the tax revenue it receives. All right. So if the government has a surplus, I know, very rarely has a surplus in our, history, in our memory, but if it does have a surplus, it can also contribute to savings. So private savings equals essentially disposable income minus consumption. So the consumer can spend as much as his or her total disposable income. They actually spend consumption and so the difference is what we call private savings, savings by consumers. Public savings is the savings essentially by the government. So it's total tax revenue, that's the government's income, minus how much it spends, government revenue, or government spending, excuse me. And that gives us what we call a surplus um, for a given period, and we'll call that the public savings. If we put the, bo the two of those together, we have national savings. Right, so that's just total savings 
total savings within the economy. And if we just add those in, we end up with y minus t minus c plus t minus g or y minus c minus g because these two taxes offset one another. So here's our supply of loanable funds. Okay, we can then superimpose over that the demand for loanable funds or the investment function and the intersection of these two, right, is going to be the real interest rate. And at an equilibrium level, well the actual equilibrium level of investment is determined by the amount of savings which is fixed because all of these things in the savings function are fixed in our model. And therefore we have a real interest rate of R star that's right here and S bar is our equilibrium investment rate or investment level and that explains the loanable funds framework. It's so one important thing to realize about this. Equilibrium in the goods market, um, in the goods market and um, the supply market so that aggregate supply, aggregate demand, when those two are in equilibrium, that implies that the loanable funds market is also in equilibrium. Why? Because what is the factor that equilibrates all of these systems? It's R. R changes in order to make those in equilibrium. So the R that makes this in equilibrium, this loanable funds framework in equilibrium, also puts the goods market in equilibrium. So at the point where um, we're at the equilibrium interest rate for investment, we will also have equilibrium um, between aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And that concludes our discussions for lecture, si or lecture 5 and also for chapter 3.